that I had shared the Nobel Prize with was hired by David Lee, my thesis advisor, as a postdoc to develop something called Pomeranchuk cooling. Pomeranchuk was one of Lev Landau's graduate students in, in, in Russia. He was a member of what they called the Landau School. Uh, and so even though his area of expertise as a, uh, as a trained physicist was in, in high temperature plasmas, he became very interested when in, in helium-3 when uh, uh, Ed Hamill's group published their results. And so he argued that, that in fact, probably in liquid helium-3, the entropy or disorder in that system would drop linearly to zero, as it does for conduction electrons in metals. Whereas in the solid phase, even though you have this wonderful positional order, each nuclear spin on the atoms were localized, could either point up or point down in a magnetic field, and the entropy of that system is just R, the gas constant, times the logarithm, natural logarithm, of the number of estates available per particle. And so the number of states available is exactly two, either up or down. And so this line is R log two. This is the entropy of the solid. And then at some very low temperature, which he guessed was, was less than a 10 millionth of a degree above absolute zero, the, the uh, solid would, in fact, undergo nuclear spin ordering. Uh, so this was his prediction. And then the idea is, is that if you start with liquid at some temperature and you convert it to solid, you have decreased the, ent ent well, the entropy has stayed constant, but in fact the temperature now has dropped by a huge amount. So this, however, seemed highly improbable to experimentalists. In particular, the amount of work you had to do to compress and solidify liquid helium-3 vastly exceeded by about three orders of magnitude uh, this latent heat, which now is negative because of the fact that the liquid is more highly ordered than the solid. So if you do this, if you actually form solid, to form solid at constant temperature, you have to actually add heat to the system. It's a very unusual system. If you don't do that, the, the s solid that is formed will rob entropy from the liquid, and therefore the system would cool. And so this was eventually tried by one of Peter Kapitz's students. This is the person that got the Nobel Prize for his work done in 1937. And, and uh, this was in 19, uh, what time was this? About 1960 something anyway. So it's go Kapitza uh, raised the, 1965, raised the pressure by compressing his liquid helium-3. And then once he reached the melting curve, this is the melting line, this is solid, and this is liquid he would go along the melting line to lower and lower and lower temperatures, ultimately coming off at a temperature on the order of 15 thousandths of a degree. Now, I could actually get that low a temperature with my helium-3, helium-4 dilution refrigerator, but in fact, uh, Dave Lee and Bob Richardson felt that, that in, in, in principle, if one was very careful, one could start here and end up at this temperature, which is well below one thousandth of a Kelvin. And so that was, in fact, uh, what I was supposed to do for my PhD thesis. So I actually, during my second year of graduate study, I, I very briefly took up skiing. And that's when I had a, her a terrible skiing accident, severed two ligaments in my right knee. And it was while I was recovering from knee surgery in a hospital bed that I designed this apparatus. This is, in fact, the apparatus that was used in the discovery of superfluidity in helium-3. So I like to tell graduate students that, in fact, uh, there is probably a hidden lining in every dark cloud, but you have to use the opportunity that's been made available to you. In this case, I had nothing else to do. It was either watching sitcoms on television, which were terrible, <laughs> or in fact design an apparatus. So this is where the helium-3 sits and then to, to uh, solidify that you have to decrease the volume and I would do that by pushing a metal bellows inside this region using another larger bellows uh, pressurized with superfluid helium-4. Then we measured the temperature by looking at the polarization of platinum-195 nuclei. Basically it's a Boltzmann distribution then. And we measured the melting pressure using a very elegant uh, pressure transducer de uh, developed by people at University of Florida. So this is Osharoff's Pomeran check cell. And so at the end of my third year of graduate study, something very important happened to me. 
<laughs> and, and this is, uh, uh, so I'd been dating this Chinese girl who's sitting in the first row. Raise your hand, Phyllis. Okay. <laughs> So we, we kind of seemed to hit it off pretty well, but, but she got her Ph.D. after just three years at Cornell, and she was then going to have to go back to, to uh, Taiwan unless I took, took this drastic step. So it was actually, it was actually on her birthday which is, uh, that, that, in fact, I proposed that we, I think I may have proposed that we get engaged. It was very hard to say get married. It seemed so final to everything like that. But anyway, we, we've been married now 38 years. So she then took a, a postdoc in biochemistry, and that told me that I had exactly two years to get my work done. So the, the, the fourth year of graduate study for me, I, I don't actually talk about it here, but I had uh, uh, worked with another graduate student to study liquid helium-3 external to the Pomeranchuk cell. We made a heat exchange which allowed us to cool sa other samples so I think we got down to about five thousandths of a degree outside of the Pomeranchuk cell. Uh, but then, you know, going into uh, the, the summer of 1971, uh, uh, I talked to David Lee, my thesis advisor, and I said, what do you want me to do for my PhD thesis? Because I'd actually been involved in several successful experiments, but they were other people's PhD work, so I couldn't use that. So he said it was very easy. All I had to do was measure some property of solid helium-3 through its nuclear spin ordering transition. Now, actually no one had ever reached that very low temperature of two thousandths of a degree where that transition was expected, but in fact the transition was actually at nine ten thousandths of a degree, a much lower temperature. Anyway, so I decided I should try to do that. But the problem was we didn't have any any uh, thermometers which remained in thermal equilibrium uh, uh, with the helium-3, so we couldn't actually measure its temperature. But then David Lee produced a paper from a preprint that had been sent to us from the Wheatley group. They had, looked, they had applied magnetic fields and looked at how the melting pressure changed as, as a function of magnetic field. So here we're in a magnetic field, I guess, of 12.9 of kilogauss, or for you, it's 1.29 Tesla. I think people don't use kilogauss anymore. Anyway, and so this, these are my data, and they're entirely consistent with, with the theory curve, which is, but you can see that they're scattered in my data. Uh, this is what the Wheatley group had found, because in fact there was something wrong with their thermometer. So it, this is a very good advice that if you are trying to, to do something uh, based on someone else's work, first reproduce their results. Because if you can't do that, in fact, there's probably no reason it going on. Anyway, so, so this didn't look like it was going to be a very good PhD thesis, and I tried to get rid of the scatter in this data. And after three months, two other graduate students that had been waiting for a key piece of my equipment uh, went to David Lee and Bob Richardson arguing that I should have to give up this magnet that I'd used to do NMR, and, uh, and, and uh, the two professors agreed with that. And so this, of course, I was, you know, first of all, this didn't look like a very exciting experiment, uh, and, and then they take away some of my equipment. I mean, it seems like a good time to maybe warm the cryostat up. I've been cold for three months working very hard, and maybe uh, my wife and I should go camping in the Adirondack Mountains. But I didn't do that. I said, maybe when they cool down their cryostat, something will go wrong. An uh, electrical lead will fall off or, or a, a, a leak will, will open up, in which case I would get the magnet back. But I, but I said, as long as I have to keep my apparatus cold, I, I should be doing something because I'm having to put liquid helium in it every day. So I said, okay, I'm going to do study this Pomeranchuk cooling process 